yeah, g'day everyone, and thanks for the uh, for the intro. Um, to start off with, I just wanted to apologise. Really, I'm I'm sitting in uh, Sydney Airport, and you might get some background noise from time to time. But uh, like currently in the announcement, but we'll uh, we'll see how we go. And so, just a little bit about Integrity Ag. Uh, to start with, um, yeah, we're a specialist agri environmental consulting company. We've got uh, offices in Queensland, New South Wales, and WA. Um, we did a lot of work in, in carbon and biodiversity baselines um, and uh, of, of late also ERF project development and we're also across all major ag industries as well. Um, historically been also involved in a lot of research uh, in the ag industry, ag, ag kind of sector as well as as well as well carbon and uh, yeah pleased to be able to work with uh, Climate Active at the moment in developing a new insetting method um, which is another topic. Um, but uh, yeah, all, all those things. I guess one of the things that um, I wanted to say as well is, you know, fundamentally we do believe in agriculture and its, its role in productivity and you know, providing food and fibre for all of us, um, but we're certainly committed to sustainability. So um, that's a little bit, about, I guess, what, what we're, we're about. And we're certainly interested in supporting DAF and this project just to get more information out there, uh, drive participation and, and just help folk understand how things work, I think is a, a really good driver. Um, just a disclaimer, uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, we do support um, you know, landholders to develop uh, carbon projects. We're not a commission provider. We do that on a fee-for-service basis. Uh, so I just wanted to make that known. And uh, and yeah, all right. Well, let's uh, let's kick into it. Alrighty. So what the plan is for today will provide a little bit of an overview of the current HIR market uh, across the country. And and then the intent is to go through and unpack the method. And as Hayley mentioned, it is quite technical. Um, so apologies in advance about that, but it is stru structured around, presentation structured around what it means to actually do it and, and assess it. And, uh, and, and we'll go through that. Um, we'll cover things like baseline forest cover, what are the requirements around baseline forest cover, how to assess forest potential, all these new terms, which I'm sure uh, we'll have to become familiar with, and then look at kind of things like potential um, strain carbon credit unit returns and costings as well. Importantly, we'll also look at key risks, and and there are a range of risks uh, to be fully informed that you know folks do need to participate in or, or need to consider to participate. Um, and we'll also look at the project life cycle, uh, and we've got a couple of decision support tools which we'll run through. And really that's uh, intended on just assisting yeah, folk to, well, how do I take the next step? So could it be feasible on my place? Um, and uh, how would I go and ascertain that? And I guess another thing to mention is that uh, certainly Integrity Ag is not the uh, 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 be all and end all, if you like, around um, human regeneration. We're a, a relatively uh, recent um, participant in providing this service. Um, I think uh, we've got roughly about a dozen projects in various various uh, states of, um, of uh, where they're up to. Um, importantly, the main thing to realise is the clean energy regulator is the decision maker. Uh, all the things that we've been talking about today is um, our understanding of working with the clean energy regulator, but of course, if you do have specific questions or if there's anything in doubt, uh, the clean energy regulator is the folk that you have to go and talk to. Alrighty, there is going to be some jargon, so it's probably helpful just to um, have a chat about that. Um, and a lot of this jargon is probably well known to you if you've been involved in the carbon carbon world, but with the first one, and most importantly, you know, particularly around HIR, uh, is additionality. So really, additionality, um, if you boil it down, uh, it means a, it can mean a few things, but it really means is that sequestration. Um, it needs to be unlikely to otherwise occur in the ordinary course of events. So it really does need, needs, needs to be a level of intervention in order for that country to come back and regenerate. And that's that's a really key point, um, which, you know, when you're thinking about, well, for my, for my property in my context, um, you know, what can I do? What In order to satisfy that test, which is a key test in the offset scheme, um, what will I need to do in order to allow that country to regenerate? Some other definitions we're going to chat about forest. So forest in the context of human juice and you know, regeneration is 
uh, native woody vegetation that has reached a height greater than two metres and also greater than 20% uh, canopy cover. So that's uh, that's a key uh, factor to consider. We also talk about what has forest potential. So I guess similar to what the word says, forest potential are areas which are going to grow into forest. And the method specifically requires things like you know the number of stems per hectare um, of a range of different species, a range of different native trees that would grow into a forest. So. There's some things to consider. If, if you do want to participate, you need to have country that has forest potential, ultimately. Carbon estimation areas, I'm sure most uh, most folk understand what they are, but um, they're really just an area that you allocate underneath your project area where the project mechanism, so the activities, the, the technical term, the HIR activity uh, that you're going to apply, the activity which is additional, which is going to help that country grow back, that's where that's going to be applied. And of course, that's where the the Australian carbon credit units, the activities will be generated from as well. Full CAM, so the full carbon accounting model, that's the, the modelling tool the Australian government published and utilised for modelling sequestration under the HIR method. Um, also models project emissions, things like fires uh, and, and those type of things. So and fuel use as part of a project. So that's the modelling tool which uh, essentially um, predicts and allows you subject to things like regeneration checks to be issued credits. And finally, future forest potential. This is a interesting one. We've got forest, forest potential, future forest potential. Future forest potential is really a category of land where it's uh, technically eligible under the HI method. Um, so i.e. It's, it's, it's had a suppression activity for 10 years during the baseline period uh, and it's, it's not hasn't had forest cover during the last 10 years, and we'll get into all of that, but it's not currently showing forest potential. It doesn't currently have the stems on the ground. And so when we look at you know, feasibilities, for example, or, or, or having a discussion about uh, what you might have in your place, really a lot of the country comes into those two different categories. What's currently showing forest potential? What's currently eligible to uh, put a HR project over? And what might show forest potential in the future um, if you implemented some HR activities, if you implemented that additional land use change and um, enabled um, that country to come back. So importantly, the, um, the HR me uh, method has a period of up to six years where you can register a project and then kind of wait and see. Obviously, you're doing the activity, um, but wait and see to see if, those, if that regeneration occurs. Uh, so there is a, a little bit of a delay. You don't have to necessarily have um, the regeneration on the ground when you register it. Alrighty, so just a couple of slides about the national HR market um, at the moment. Um, what we can see on screen is uh, all the registered property boundaries that uh, have registered under HIR, and there's certainly um, certainly quite a quite a few. Um, you'll notice that there's really two main areas of concentration, um, and those are in the in New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, hopefully, you can see my mouse. Uh, the Mulga Belt, if you like, the Mulga bioregion and the uh, the Cobar Penny Plain bioregion in particular of New South Wales and then also over in WA. But um, what we have in total at the moment, um, 370 active projects nationally roughly, um, covering some 30 million hectares, so certainly a substantial area, that's project areas. Of those, 221 projects have had accused issued to date. Um, this next slide will just show you um, where those accused have been issued. Um, and just as an example, last financial year, so that's 21-22, uh, just in terms of the value of accused issued, approximately $192 million, assuming $30 in ACU. Obviously, that uh, there's a lot of those uh, projects under contracts for less than that, but that gives you an idea of, of the type of value in the projects that have been uh, and the ACUs being issued under them. It's also, as I think we've we've put in the um, introduction to this uh, this whole session, it's roughly 45% of the um, accus issues to date. So it's by no means um, um, well, it's it's very significant, really, this method. It's um, and obviously it's subject to some scrutinisation at the moment, which I think is a great thing. Um, but I think uh, yeah, it's certainly a, been a significant player, and I, I think it uh, it'll certainly be a, a significant. Uh, abatement method in the future as well. 
some general statistics. I've mentioned a few of these, and um, these are as of September this year. So you can see kind of going around from clockwise, if you like. So um, in terms of project permanence, uh, there's certainly most projects are um, uh, looking at a 25-year uh, permanence to date, um, which is just uh, interesting to note. There's roughly about 40 projects per year being registered over the last 10 odd years. Um, you can see the ACUs issued to that over time as well. Um, and in terms of ACU, actual actual yields, there's a bit of a box plot there, top of top left of the screen, which is really just um, looking at the uh, the yields on a ACU per hectare per year basis for each of those for all those projects, and looking at it against the project area. So it's not it's not the actual carbon estimation area. Often HR projects, as, as uh, you might be aware, often they're registered for whole property boundaries registered. So, but thinking at uh, at that level, at a property boundary level, current yields are around the one ACU per hectare per year. Um, kind of yields at a, at a property boundary level, obviously they'll be significant more, more at a carbon estimation level as well. So just um, before we get into the um, the case study, I just wanted to uh, introduce Melanie Leather. Um, so Melanie, as Hayley mentioned, is, is doing a case study on this particular project and uh, is a uh, landholder of property Hazeldean. So I might hand over to her and she's gonna talk us through a little bit about um, this property, uh, why she's thinking about um, human-induced regeneration, so in a very different location from the Mulga, Mulga Belt um, and, uh, and just some of her perspectives. So thanks, Melanie, over to you. Thanks, Simon, and um, thank you everyone for uh, being with us today and, and this is such an important conversation to have and I'm really keen to be included so thank you. Um, let it, I'll just start with a little bit about ourselves and how we operate and then um, talk about um, the project we're looking at at Hazeldean and some of our um, concerns and uh, advantages that we might see with that project. So Leather Cattle Co is a family run operation, including my husband, Rob and I, in partnership with our son and his wife, Chloe. Adam and Chloe actually live at Hazeldean. So we've got three properties covering an area of 17 and a half thousand acres in central Queensland, where we breed and finish cattle for organic, EU and natural pasture fed markets. We're currently running around 5,000 head of cattle across the three properties. And we've got a mix of Brahman, Brahman crossed with Limousin, um, Belmont, Brangus, um, and we've just recently, this week, actually invested in some full blood wagyus. And uh, considering um, having an F1 cross at Hazeldean, so we've we just got to make those decisions at the moment. But look, our family's committed to working towards a sustainable future for our business, our environment, our animals, and our people. And we're also very keen to be in that, um, working in that climate space. So Hazeldean, we purchased um, three years ago in April, and it's around nine and a half thousand acres, and we're currently running around 950 breeders there. Um, all the progeny goes out of Hazeldean at Weaning, um, and it comes over to our Barfield property where we either finish or background into the feeder market. Hazeldean is currently in conversion to organics, and it'll go fully certified by the middle of next year. So when we first went to Hazelden, we, we sort of would have liked to see a lot more trees there. It, it's been very heavily cleared in the past. And we sort of know that, you know, trees are valuable to protect our, they protect our ground cover. They're good for increasing our biodiversity, you know, and the fungi and all those healthy bugs that live around trees are really important to our soils and capturing that moisture in, in our soils as well. The other thing, that they're excellent shade for our cattle, you know, and we've noticed certainly it's getting hotter and drier and we wanted to have that protection um, as an animal welfare um, thing for our cattle. Uh, across our other properties, Barfield, we're currently um, looking at a soil carbon project and registering with the ERF. Um, the Four Mile, we're doing an enhancing remnant vegetation pilot there and we thought, well, what can we do at Hazeldean? What's going to be the most suitable thing for Hazeldean? Hazeldean's 100% granite, um, so we didn't think soil carbon was going to be a, a really suitable project for that one. Um, and certainly the human-induced revegetation um, 
look like probably one of our better options. Um, of course, we wanted to take control of this project. We don't. We wanted to do it ourselves, so we thought first we would contact uh, Integrity Ag to do a um, cost-benefit analysis for us. Um, you know, and we really need their expert advice around, um, you know, how we could go about it. I guess some of the things we're hesitant about, um, we're concerned if we left the regrowth, um, you know, will re regulation maps later come in and change and cause us, you know, some problems down the track. So we're, we're quite concerned about that. Um, we're really concerned, will it change the productivity of our property? Will we still be able to run the same amount of cattle? Um, and, you know, so they're things we need to know. We're also concerned, will it change the value of the property? Um, you know, more trees sometimes in, in our area, in the North Burnet there can um, actually decrease the value of your property. So, you know, all important things we wanted to know. We're also particularly interested in the species of trees and their potential commercial timber value. Um, on one of our other properties, we've harvested commercial timber for over 30 years in a sustainable manner. So we really understand those um, commercial timber markets and we, we know that there's um, species on Hazeldean that are suited for that as well. So, you know, is it going to impact uh, should we decide later down the track that we wanted to do commercial timber off there, what would happen? Um, and, and the other, I think the final thing we're probably worried about, and there'll be a lot of more things that we think about, no doubt, but um, will more suitable methods come up later on that would be a better option for Hazeldean because it's such an evolving market? Um, so there, there's some of the things we're worried about, um, but, you know, and I think we're really pleased to be working with Integrity Ag to get that really solid cost-benefit analysis and make some informed decisions from there. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, so look, the um, the case study is really going to be occurring, or has occurred in two parts. We're kind of halfway through it. Um, we've done a desktop analysis, um, which I'm going to run through now, and kind of go through the tic tacs of how that works. Um, the second part of it is going to be some on-ground assessments, which Haley and the DAF team are going to look at and do. So it well might be that we might revisit this um, later on next year, perhaps, uh, and look at where that where that uh, landed. So we don't have all the answers actually um, right now, but uh, we'll go through and share what we are, where we're up to and what, what the um, implications are. Some of the questions are, of course, in, in those earlier slides I showed, with, you know, where a lot of the human juice regeneration projects happen to date and obviously pointed out particularly the Cobar Penny Plain around Cobar and the, uh, the New South Wales and Queensland Mulga lands. Um, the question really is, I mean, a lot of that, a lot of that, those projects, one has to assume that that's really a function there of, you know, the economics in terms of land value and productive capacity is a little bit lower relative to the carbon yields, and those areas are, you know, areas that meet meet the current method, which is why they've been taken up. But I guess the question that's not answered is where can the the HIR method apply um, in the rest of the country? And there's a lot of areas that are regenerating and. As um, as Melanie said, what are the productive impacts? What are the productive capacity impacts of that? And what are the land value impacts as well? Perhaps a um, whole range of different considerations to see whether or not we can get regeneration to work and, and operate well. So that's part of the objectives, I guess, of this case study. And that'll those questions, of course, won't be answered immediately. We'll have to work through that over time. Yeah, so just in terms of the key requirements, uh, fundamentally, of course, it's all about enabling regeneration. So what we're talking about there, we're going from below 20% canopy cover and regenerating to exceed 20% canopy cover, typically within 15 years. It's the standard time frame that's needed. And of course, we're doing that through additional and new management activities, and that's what we talked about earlier. Those additional activities need to... Uh, be uh, materially new uh, needs to be activities which assist and uh, support the regeneration of that area. Um, taking land from forest potential to forest within 15 years, I mentioned that already, and of course forest potential being country that has the minimum stems on it per hectare um, to forest. And one of the things that's uh, required to be excluded is uh, what, what's called baseline forest cover. So that's any area that's had uh, forest uh, during the 10-year period from prior to registration uh, needs to be excluded. 
and uh, we'll get we'll get right into what that means specifically as well. Um, also, there needs to be suppression evidence. So during that baseline period, there needs to be uh, activities which suppress forest during that period, and you need to be able to evidence those. And lastly, um, in terms of key requirements, uh, those activities which you need to do in order to support regeneration, they're known as uh, land management or, or HIR activities, and they include things like grazing exclusion, you might decide to remove stock for a period of time to allow uh, country to, to regenerate. Uh, it might be strategic cattle grazing uh, or timed grazing. It could even be the, uh, the addition of uh, watering points to allow the uh, grazing to be uh, more evenly managed across country. Uh, also, it could be uh, decisions to cease clearing uh, if, if you have clearing consent for your land and also uh, things like pest and, uh, and weed management. Uh, in terms of pests, obviously, particularly in the, the northern part of New South Wales there, the rangeland goats can be a significant issue, and that's why one of the reasons why that is a uh, eligible activity. So forest, base one forest cover, so the, the key requirement in the, uh, is that any area that's had pre-existing forest during a 10 year baseline is required to be excluded. Um, Typically, that's assessed uh, uh, through the use of the national forest and cover, sparse cover mapping. So that's a publicly available data set the national inventory team use, but it also requires on-ground assessments to confirm it. So in terms of a desktop analysis um, in the context of Hazeldean, uh, we looked at the, uh, the baseline cover that's there. Uh, it turns out that largely this property has not had baseline forest cover in the last 10 years. So it's 10 years from a prospective registration date. Um, and so largely most of the property is eligible. Zooming out a little bit, you can see that analysis um, in that region. And, and so you can see the importance really straight away that, you know, if you're done a look at a, a HIR carbon project that it really that is prudent to have a look at this mapping. Um, at the end of this presentation, I do have some tools to show you on how you can do that and give yourself a rough idea about how much country is on your on your property which will be eligible assuming of course you can apply those additional activities and, and the regeneration has forest potential so over to forest potential um, so this is um, a key requirement uh, to be stratified for land to be what we call stratified which is um, you know broken up or identified within a project area. Um, to be stratified as a carbon estimation area, it does need to have forest potential. And how that's assessed is looking at um, the number of stems on the ground, um, the, uh, the stratification guidelines, which is one of the main documents that the Clean Energy Regulator published, which details this, includes uh, the numbers uh, and of, of stems that you need. But as you can see, uh, that, that carbon estimation area to have forest potential at the time of stratification, um, at the initial stratification. And I do have a slide which will take you through all those steps in the various different stages of a project. Um, you must have a certain number of stems and seedlings that happens on the ground. And of course, those seedlings need to be able to reach, have the potential to reach uh, two metres or 20% ground cover. Put it another way, Baseline forest is excluded. Any land that is currently forest is excluded, of course. It's picked up in the in the uh, in the baseline cover check. Um, but in order to be eligible, you need to be in that middle ground of having regeneration on the ground that it was allowed to regenerate, and that, that regenerate that that was through additional activities, like for example, foregoing clearing, like for example. Um, managing the grazing to inhibit, uh, to allow, sorry, the regeneration to occur, then that would meet those uh, definitions of, being, of having forest potential. In terms of the numbers, it's always, sometimes it's challenging to work through, well, you know, how, how many do I need and what does that mean? And, and there is some math involved. So this screenshot that you're looking on screen at the moment is taken from the method stratification guidelines and it it tells you that for a given mature crown diameter, so assuming the first column, for example, a mature tree of five metres, 
then you would need 102 of those trees on a per hectare basis in order to reach 20% ground cover. So there is, um, I guess, one of the uh, provisions within the method means that uh, at the time of initial stratification, um, you can have 50% of those stems present. So there is an assumption that it will continue to uh, regenerate over time. So um, I guess importantly, if you were to look at your country and say, look, how do I have the right number of stems? Um, there's a few ways of looking at that, but certainly you'd need to assess, okay, so I might have um, bimble box or popular box, for example, in my place. Well, I need to understand for starters, uh, what does that, those trees typically, their mature crown diameter typically reach in remnant patches? So that would give an understanding of, okay, which, which uh, what the mature crown diameter might be. And then you would then need to go and count those. Um, typically, the counting of those is done uh, using a, um, a biodiversity or vegetation assessment standard plot. Uh, there's different ways that can be done, but uh, a standard that's often used is 50 metres by 20 metres, and uh, that equates to 0 0.2 of a hectare, so it's quite uh, handy to be able to multiply up to reach those hectare rates. Alrighty, so over to potential returns in the case of, of, of this particular project on, on Hazeldean. What we've done is we've looked at all the paddocks that are eligible, we've excluded baseline forest cover. We then made, had to make some assessments around which country does is currently uh, demonstrating forest potential, uh, has indications of stems on the ground and which doesn't. So what is that future forest potential? And that's what you can see. We've kind of looked at how to really quantify that in order to give the landholder, in this case, Mally, just a bit of an understanding of uh, likely estimation of yields. Four areas that are showing forest potential. The other thing which needs to be taken into consideration is that those areas need to be set back or discounted, if you like, uh, for in their existing biomass is present. So it's really important that um, understanding, yes, if it's got forest potential, uh, the other, the secondary thing, it's important to understand, well, what is, what's the age class of those of that regeneration, which it takes into consideration what the potential yields will be. So um, that's the potential returns on on this property. Really, the from a desktop level, it's really challenging on on Hazeldean to make some accurate assessments, which is really why um, the team need to go on ground and and the on ground exercise will involve rolling out some some plots, looking at those densities and really trying to further identify exactly which areas do currently meet the method, which areas do have forest potential. Um, it's one aspect. For those areas that have forest potential, the method requires quite a significant biodiversity effort, biodiversity survey effort. Um, those areas need to be uh, mapped into, diff into their different vegetation groups and into the age classes, like I mentioned. And the other important thing as well is to exclude areas or exclude country that's already met the forest definition. And of course, we have some modelled data and that needs to be ground truth. So there's really two aspects of those uh, those assessments, which would then firm up the yields, if you like, for, on this particular project. Um, all right, in terms of key risk to consider with this, with this method, obviously, um, you know, we've been talking about this uh, and it's a concern for Melanie, but long-term grazing capacity. Uh, now, I think it's it's prudent to assume that um, this kind of country, once it has regenerated, is probably not going to be um, enabled to be cleared in the future. So, and that's certainly the intent uh, of the, um, the permanence period. Um, so that's one thing to take into consideration. Um, it's going to be likely to be there for a long time. Uh, it's important that you assess long-term grazing capacity and really from that change in state, from the current state uh, to a future state. There is, there well might be impacts on land value as well, um, and they might be positive during the crediting period, perhaps negative afterwards. Um, so there's, there's a few things to consider. Uh, 
the diminishing economic returns. It's really only an economic return for 25 years, the crediting period. So uh, there's a range of things that we should consider in that respect. Um, and then, of course, the only uh, the main criteria of this method is to regenerate that country. So if that area doesn't uh, regenerate, uh, doesn't meet what we call regeneration checks, which are done at roughly five year intervals and that they're remote sensing checks to make sure that the country is uh, progressing towards 20% cover, then uh, the, uh, the areas may, may be required to be paused. Um, there might need to be more field work to go out in the ground and, uh, and re-stratify so to separate out the areas which are not yielding. So, you know, obviously um, that's a significant uh, consideration. We've got to be, make sure that um, the country that you are putting in will regenerate with apply the HR activities as well. In terms of fire risk, um, fire is considered a, is, is an emission source, of course. So any fires during the um, course of the project need to be taken into consideration in terms of the emissions as does fuel usage. But importantly, fire can also damage, obviously, the, uh, the stands of timber as well. So that's something that needs to be taken into consideration because there's a risk. And of course, there well might be, um, there are other risks to consider as well, which are broader than just further participating in the HIR. Um, things like uh, market access, uh, for example, um, you know, generating credits uh, on a property, um, then well might be a future where you might need those credits in order to attach to a product to access a certain market. That's obviously speculative, but it's, it's more than that in some instances as well. So um, something to consider. Um, also something to consider that does take a, a period of time, typically roughly about three years to begin to yield credits. So often it's a slow burn initially. And uh, and that's an important thing to think about, think about because if you were hoping to supply credits into say 2030 market, um, then really that you'd have to be getting a wig along to look at putting a project in place well before, three to four years before. Just in terms of the, uh, the project life cycle for a human just regeneration project, there is a lot of content in this slide. I like to call these things a horrendogram. I'll try to walk through it slowly um, and, uh, and kind of take you through it. But what we're looking at here is, I guess, the life cycle of a, a project, assuming that it was year one of it would start next year, 1 January, and assuming that it's a 25 year permanence as well. Um, so just straight away, you can see this is a, a typical full cam sequestration curve for regeneration. Um, and you can see straight away that, you know, the first three years, as I mentioned, is quite, uh, uh, kind of low in terms of carbon yields, typically yielding at between the 10 and 15 meter mark is the peak, and then it's starting to slowly uh, tail off. In terms of the project, um, obviously there's um, pre-work that folk need to do um, prior to registration. There are some requirements that the clean energy regulator provide in terms of notify notifying requirements. So if you do intend to register more than one third of your property, uh, you need to go through that notification process. Um, there could be feasibility assessments like the ones that we're doing here, for example, um, that you might want to look at. Um, if you engage the carbon provider to support you, they would, um, they well might do those on your behalf. Um, so, you know, there's a, a pre-work and as we talked about earlier, the exclusion of baseline cover. Um, in terms of uh, once, you've, once your project is registered with the clean energy regulator, um, as I mentioned earlier, you do have a period of up to six years uh, before you are required to submit your first uh, offset report and also required to do that initial stratification. So that initial stratification is all about doing that intensive field work to uh, stratify areas which are showing forest potential to exclude areas uh, which were baseline forest uh, and to uh, uh, map them into different age classes as well as the communities, the vegetation communities. So it is a significant um, vegetation survey effort. You don't have to uh, wait until year six. Um, you know, some implication for waiting to that long is to uh, allow country that is future forest potential, if you like, so area which is not currently showing the right stems on the ground to come back 
if you were satisfied, for example, that you're happy that you've got enough country that's already showing forest potential, then you could well do that earlier. That's really a decision for you. Once that initial stratification is done, first offset report is submitted. It's also a requirement to do an external audit and there's also a regeneration check as well. And that really, all those things come together and then the credits begin to flow from that. Um, with this particular method, as is similar to most of the regeneration methods, there is a maximum period of five years, which is called the reporting period. You can bring that back to a period of six months. So if you wanted to, you could report on a six monthly basis. I think typically most folk are reporting at a yearly basis. Um, so I guess the key point of that is that the income flows on a yearly basis. Once that initial field work, that initial stratification, that first also report is submitted. Moving along down the timeline, um, there's another regeneration check at year 10, um, and another regeneration check at, at year 15. And so, as I mentioned earlier, those are remote sensing checks where to ensure that your carbon est estimation area has attained the right level of forest cover. Um, so nominally, um, there's a little bit more to this, but nominally it's roughly 7.5% um, at year 6, 10% at year 10, and of course, reaching forest cover at year 15. Um, in terms of uh, ex external audits, um, the Clean Energy Regulator, once you register a project, will provide a, an audit program. There is a minimum of three per project, and there are some other audits required on the basis of thresholds. So, for example, a particular period, uh, a particular reporting period, claims more than 100,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, then uh, additional audit may be triggered. So those ex are external audits, of course, and uh, they're uh, done to support the offset support and an important piece of the integrity of the scheme. All right, well, I think we're, um, we've covered an awful lot and there's a lot of technical, a lot of technical components in there as well. Um, so uh, I hope that's been helpful. Just wanted to finish really with um, this outline. There are a couple of tools which are available, um, a few different tools, um, which would be helpful uh, if you were doing, a, I guess, an initial assessment against your, you wanted to have a look at your place and say, look, you know, what's ballpark, what would be eligible for one, uh, and what would the potential yields be too. And that would give you really an upper limit. Um, and then it really comes down to doing those uh, extra assessments in terms of what paddocks perhaps what I've considered this, doing this project in and do those paddocks have forest potential? Do they have the right stems on the ground, the right regeneration on the ground that's going to grow into a forest within 15 years? So um, I think everyone's uh, hopefully familiar with the look-see tool uh, which CSIRO publish. Um, that tool enables you to draw a polygon around your property uh, and and then we'll provide you an abatement estimate for it. One of the things the tool does though, it requires, uh, it gives you an option of discounting your polygon or your property boundary by how much forest cover is there. And, and that's a real tricky thing to kind of understand unless you had some other way of doing that. So there is a few mechanisms out there at the moment. Um, SIBO Labs has got a property benchmark report which would be useful in doing that. It's a paid service working out how much forest cover is on your, on your property. There is another platform called Digital Agricultural Services, which is also paid, but offers some free trials, and you can navigate to, a prop to your property, and it will also tell you, uh, not your entire baseline, but it will tell you for the last year, um, in terms of the last year of that forest cover data set, um, how much of that area is under forest. So you can use that as a reasonable estimate um, to, to uh, I guess give that ballpark figure um, of what is the potential abatement on that property uh, under a HR project and then of course um, the next question comes into again do those areas have forest potential and uh, investigating that further. 